1945, the United States of America and the Soviet Union began the Cold War after defeating Germany and Japan in World War II. Although war was never officially declared, these two countries fought indirectly with the space race, proxy wars, and the arms race. Of the three, the arms race made a very large impact on America with the development of nuclear weapons. In mid-March of 1951, a site northwest of Denver, Colorado is chosen to be the location for a nuclear production facility that will no later be known as Rocky Flats. As construction of Rocky Flats is hurried, an error involving planning of the site is left unnoticed. Site plans specifically state that wind blowing over the plant should not blow towards a major city, but there is a mistake in the data. Instead of taking wind readings from the site itself, engineers take readings from Stapleton Airport, which is on the other side of Denver, where winds come from the south. Rocky Flats is well known for extreme conditions, including Chinooks that come over the Rocky Mountains at gusts of over 100 miles per hour. These blow right into a major city nearby, Arvada, Colorado. Rocky Flats will be the only plant in the country to create these triggers, each costing $4 million and containing enough breathable particles of radioactive plutonium to kill every human on Earth. Plutonium, which is a silvery metal, often spontaneously catches fire and is the same radioactive metal that created Fat Man, the nuclear bomb dropped on Nagasaki. On September 11, 1957, a fire started in Building 71 that was designed to be fireproof. The fire raged for more than 13 hours until it was put out with water, creating an even greater risk for an explosion. After the fire, plutonium was detected more than 30 miles from the plant, and a school that was 12 miles away from the site had heavy levels of contamination in the soil. One year later, an incinerator is installed in Building 71, perhaps the only of its kind in the world. Its job is to burn radioactive waste so that it doesn't pile up, which could potentially be highly dangerous. This will later lead to evidence against Rocky Flats in court. For a few years, the plant goes on with production as usual, until one day, Mother's Day of 1969. Sometime in the morning, a few plutonium scraps catch on fire, and it isn't until 2.27 p.m. that a building heat detector finally triggers the alarm that calls the Rocky Flats Fire Department after the fire grows. As the fire department arrives, they aren't sure what to do. At around the same time, a few workers decide to try to fight the fire themselves. It gets to the point where they are helpless and decide to use water on the fire. This is a big mistake, because putting water on a fire with radioactive materials like plutonium could cause a very large explosion, known as the blue flash. Eventually, at about 8 p.m., the fire is put out using water, but not after leaking tons of more radioactive smoke out of the vents. I started out as a decon worker, which was basically a fancy janitor. I uh, moved on then to the foundry where I made pieces and parts, mm -hmm. and then I went into experimental operations where we, we attempted new processes and tried to bring them into production. And they had a college kid from CU cutting weeds along the road with a sickle, a, you know, a one-hand yeah. sickle. Yeah, yeah. They didn't want power tools, and so they had these kids out there with these sickles, and he was going along, and he hit something, and he pulled back, and he, you know, he thought it was a rock, so he went again, and the sickle stuck in a barrel. And there was a barrel that had been buried in the 50s or 60s, they're not exactly sure, and it had, through shifting in time, had worked its way up out of the ground in the weeds, and he stuck it in there and it went and it hissed. My group actually had to go out and clean that up and they built, we built a tent outside to cover it up and we put negative airflow in and we all got in suits and we went in there and we started digging and we unearthed, I think it was 40 barrels in that hole. From 1969 to 1971, Carl Johnson studies 154,170 people in a contaminated area and 423,870 people in an unexposed suburb. He finds higher than average leukemia and lung cancer rates in areas downwind, and in zones in increased contamination, there are an additional 491 cases of cancer, where the Department of Energy had estimated one. About 11,000 acres of land are contaminated with more plutonium than is what considered safe by the Department of Health, and when scientists collect soil samples around the plant, they wear face masks and don't stay for very long. Soon, the first large protest is planned, April 28th of 1978. This will be a peaceful protest, and more than 100 people plan to occupy the railroad tracks in a symbolic blockade. On the morning of April 28th, about 6,000 people gather at the West Gate. The next day, a group of about 120 protesters stay behind. They pitch camp on a railroad track at the south side of the boundaries. In front of the camp, they post a solar energy flag as well as the U.S. flag. They often chant phrases like, hell no, we won't go, but with a twist. Hell no, we won't glow. In the morning, only 65 remain, and two doves are perched on a tent frame, freezing in the cold. 
A year after the first protests, there is a second major protest. Two to three thousand people are expected and 15,000 show up. People from 22 states appear, opposing the plan and its actions. The next day, 286 men and women are arrested, and more than 600 have been arrested in the past five years. A Department of Energy study of 160 contaminated sites in the country is released to the public, and Rocky Flats is ranked number one, the most dangerous site in the U.S. Two buildings at Rocky Flats make the list of the 10 most contaminated buildings in North America, number one being Building 771. Six weeks later, 771 reopens for production with limited use of the incinerator after being closed for a period of time. Back in 1987, two men form an unlikely team looking into the plant. John Lipsky from the FBI and William Smith from the Environmental Protection Agency. They look into the rumors that 771 has been operating the incinerator illegally, as there is so much waste that they can't ship it off, but they have exceeded the max for the waste onto the property. Jim Stone, a worker at Rocky Flats, gives them this information. Lipsky decides that he wants to do a flyover of the plant using forward-looking infrared, which is also known as FLIR, and it will reveal whether there's anything thermally hot. The problem is that the plant is equipped with surface-to-air anti-aircraft missiles, so they need a letter of immunity. It is granted, and they do the flyover when 771 is supposed to be closed. On December 9th, 10th, and 15th of 1988, an FBI plane with FLIR imaging flies right over the plant. They take photos of the building, which is shut down until February 28th, and they see white plumes rising up from the smokestack. After analysis, the 771 incinerator is still in operation burning radioactive waste. Furthermore, the plant is illegally discharging radioactive liquid waste into a nearby creek. Streaks of white come from the spray fields where contaminated waste is sprayed. Narrow rays stretch across Indiana Street, indicating movement of material from the plant. 5,243 people work here at the time. Never before had two government agencies, the FBI and EPA, had planned to raid a third government agency, especially one like the DOE. Lipsky and Smith decide to call the operation Operation Desert Glow. On the morning of June 6, 1989 at 8 a.m. sharp, more than 75 FBI and EPA investigators are waiting outside the gates of the plant as FBI agent John, John Lipsky, search warrant in hand, drives to meet them. The investigation continues until 5 p.m. on June 23rd, involving more than 90 FBI and EPA agents who seize thousands of documents and hundreds of waste samples. More than 2,640 pounds of plutonium were unaccounted for. 2,900 kilograms of plutonium as well as 97,000 kilograms of solid residue, 14,000 liters of liquid residue contaminated with plutonium are stored at the plant. If all triggers produced at Rocky Flats were stacked end on end, height would be greater than 18 Empire State Buildings. And enough radioactive waste was found on the site to cover a football field to a depth of 20 feet. In 2001, Kaiser Hill LLC agrees to partially clean up Rocky Flats for an estimated $7.3 billion, but the DOE initially estimated it at around $37 billion. In 2005, they say the cleanup is complete, although remaining levels of plutonium are controversial. In 2007, 4,465 acres of the site are made a wildlife refuge, and 1,309 acres will remain close to the public. In December of 2017, a visitor center is scheduled to open at the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge. The half-life of plutonium is around 24,000 years, meaning that it will take plutonium around 24,000 years for half of the radioactivity to decay. The idea that Rocky Flats, which was closed just about 27 years ago, is now ready to open to the public can only be based on not understanding enough about this plant in plutonium. I don't think it will ever be safe. While the plant was in operation, careless storage and handling of potentially dangerous materials, human error, and putting safety behind production means Rocky Flats remains unsafe to open to the public.